Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Neil Ward. I am the director of the Mod Center. I am delighted to host this program of meeting with the experts. And it's a, a great pleasure to introduce today our expert, Dr. Jack Sobo, uh, who will be talking the subject that is fascinating and it touched the life of many women as well as men. And that is the area of vaginal infections, diagnosis, and management. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Sobel, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge in this area to everybody. We can take out our masks since both of us are vaccinated and we have enough distance here in, the in this conference. So may I ask you to introduce yourself to our uh, audience, please? Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's still light outside, but it's evening. So my name is Jack Sobel, and I'm a professor of medicine. You know, I've been at the Wayne State University, based at the Detroit Medical Center for 36 years. Um, so you recognize I have an accent. <laughs> My accent is from South Africa. I've never lost the South African accent. And uh, although when I, when I go back to South Africa, they tell me that I have an American accent. <laughs> but every day in my clinic, patients ask me where I come from. Where you come from. <laughs> so I um, came in 1985 to, be, to serve as the division chief of infectious diseases, one of the specialty groups within the Department of Internal Medicine. And um, I had an interest at the time in fungal infections, life-threatening fungal infections, in, in leukemic patients, in, in a whole host of different infections. But I specialize in one particular fungus called Candida, which is by far the commonest uh, fungal infection, um, which, can, which it, when it gets into the bloodstream can cause a life-threatening infection. On the other hand, it can also cause superficial infections, what we call a mucosal infection, which is the, the which there's no invasion. And that is particularly common in the, in the vagina or the lower genital tract. So because of my, I, ha, I had spent several years at NIH and then in, in Pennsylvania, um, and I had acquired, uh, had spent a lot of time doing research into candida infections. And this took me to the lower genital tract, it took me into the vagina. Occasionally the candida yeast or fungus can also cause a bladder infection and frequently causes an oral infection. In the United Kingdom, they call vaginal yeast infections, they call them thrush. So a woman huh. will say, I have vaginal thrush. Which we will start talking about it now. Uh, so it's fascinating. So you came from all the area of infections and you focus now in, in the vagina, yeah. in the, the female reproductive tract. So for 36 years, for 30 years, I was the chief of infectious diseases. And I spent most of my time seeing critically ill people, seriously ill people with a variety of invasive and fungal infections. But my area of expertise and research and my clinic was limited to the lower genital tract or the vagina which is the subject that we are going to cover today. Right. Yeah. So let's start with the, the, the subject. Uh, could you tell us a little about the vagina and what is this bacteria and vagina? So the lower genital tract of the vagina um, really is, um, the, <clears throat> is under normal healthy circumstances, is colonized, is populated with healthy bacteria. There are billions and billions of healthy bacteria normally present in all women. And the, the numbers change, the quality, the types of bacteria change in different phases of a woman's life. So in a pre-pubertal girl, adolescent, before the onset of her periods and menses, this is a period of her life where she lacks estrogen. A newborn baby, on the other hand, an infant, for several months after delivery, has the vaginal bacterial presence in numbers. We call it flora or microbiota, but let's stick to the word a bacterial population in infants and children. Uh, certainly in infants, 
that is um, identical to an adult because the baby is born with the hormonal influence of the maternal estrogen hormones. Oh. So a newborn baby for months not only will acquire antibodies from the mother, they acquire them from under the influence of maternal estrogen. Wow, so, so that's something that we need to talk more. So the baby receives the bacteria from the mother at the time of uh, be born. As well. Oh God, so this is fascinating. And I think we should bring more about that. But just trying to understand again, the whole aspect. We hear a lot about, you know, talk about the normal, the flora, commensal bacteria. Is this the same? What is commensal bacteria? Okay, so, so the, the bacteria that populate, that are present in a normal healthy vagina change dramatically around about puberty. And as, because uh, until the onset of, 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 of periods, the growing child, the growing girl, as she goes into adolescence, is estrogen deficient. But for, as the periods start, so they, now, now the vagina becomes an estrogen-rich environment, milieu, and now the young adolescent girl acquires the healthy bacteria that she'll have in, and, and will populate her vagina for the next 40 to 50 years. But before that, the, the vagina already had some bacteria. Oh, yeah. It's, so uh, it, it's always with bacteria. It's not a sterile uh, it, organ. The vagina is never... So telling a girl to, or a young woman there is bacteria in your in your reproductive tract yeah. is not an insult. It's not that she's sick. Yeah, sure. It's normal. Yeah. So until so puberty, the onset of periods, she will have an entirely different population of bacteria, but not the healthy lactobacillus family. Mm. They call these lactobacilli, which are the protective, health-providing bacteria, which now populate the vagina with the onset of the periods. And these, and these will be the dominant bacteria providing protection in the vagina. And they are, and this, the protection, the protective benefits of these healthy bacteria, the lactobacillus family, the genus, the species, is that it provides one, an anti, it prevents bacterial uh, pathogens or uh, bacteria that are capable of causing disease so let me stop you there because so exactly. So that was my question. What is the pathogenic bacteria before we go to the protection? You mentioned pathogenic bacteria. Yes. What is the difference between the two of them? So the, so the, the uh, normal healthy woman is populated by billions and billions of bacteria of many, many variety in very large numbers. And by the way, they, they change on a monthly basis. Oh. So during the cycle, the population numbers of bacteria vary considerably, mm -hmm. and they and then the and there are very dramatic effects during a period. These healthy lactobacilli will drop a couple of logs. In other words, the numbers drop dramatically, and and therefore the environment changes. And with sexual activity, every time there's intercourse, there's a change in the healthy bacteria numbers quantitatively in through throughout this this period. During pregnancy, they are changes once more. And mm. Likewise, with the onset of menopause, 40 years later, also will change. as the estrogen levels drop, so they will drop in the vagina as well. And so the lactobacillus healthy dominant protective bacteria will decline in the vagina of a postmenopausal woman after her periods have stopped will be dramatically different and, the, and, and, um, and this continues for the rest of It's the interesting, life. so you say even, so during the, the reproductive activities of a woman, uh, the bacteria will also be changing. All so suggest that there is also a role in, in reproduction. Hopefully we can talk about. Yes. So let's go back a little more about the pathogenic. Uh, and this goes to the, this, termin, uh, this terminology that you mentioned, the vaginitis. Would you tell us a little what is what is the meaning of vaginitis? So the word vaginitis means inflammation of the vagina, and it means under normal circumstances there's no inflammatory or no inflammation in a, in an adult woman with um, with with a healthy bacterial population. During a yeast infection, for example. For example, let's focus on the topic 
of yeast giant okay. infections or candida infections. 80 to 90 percent of women will have candida or yeast in the vagina at some sort, some stage of their reproductive life. Not so that, is that that is normal? Normal. Not yeah. before they not before they develop their periods. You don't find yeast in the vagina in young girls. Oh, so that is also associated with the hormonal changes of uh... yeast are very, very hormone dependent. Okay. And you can study yeast in a test tube and you can add estrogen to that test tube and you can dynamically change the biology of those yeast. Interesting. They have receptors in the cytoplasm of those cells. So and what is their function in reproduction? Do we, we know? No, they have yeast have no function. No function. No. Although they are responding to the to the endocrinological changes. So where do the yeast come from? Yeah. The yeast actually I have my question that. The yeast in the vagina actually originate in the gastrointestinal tract, in, oh. the, in the bowel, where they're normally present. So all so but 80% of women at some stage will 90%, any of that sort of number the yeast will populate the vagina, but usually in slow numbers. And it's coming from the, the, but the GI. 20, but 20, yes, but 20% 20 will not. Why do some women never become colonized? We use the word low numbers of, of bacteria, not causing trouble, not causing inflammation. It's, it's a process of colonization, healthy colonization. It has no biologic function, it doesn't, Interesting. It doesn't achieve much. Evolutionary, there is no role no. for that? No. But why do some women never become colonized with yeast? And that's because it's entirely dependent on the genes you inherit from your mother and father. Really? So colonization is dependent on, on your the genetic susceptibility or your genetic inheritance of a gene. And the, if you're lucky enough, not to have the right genes, you will never get though that woman will never become colonized with candida or yeast. She'll never get a candida yeast infection. On the other hand, the 80, other 80 percent will be colonized to a varying extent. The extent to which they become colonized is dependent on the genes. The gene or a woman's genes will depend on the bacteria she has in her vagina. Will mm -hmm. be determined. The bacteria she has. You know, I am an evolutionary person, but I always try to understand what is the benefit. If there is any benefit in terms of getting infe yeast infection or no yeast infection? There's, uh, there's, there's no known beneficial um, advantage to the presence of yeast in the vagina. They have no protective role. Mm -hmm. And as I said, so there we is a risk call, also. Women are co colonized. We say that about at any given time, if we go out into the Woodward Avenue, yeah, and we take a hundred healthy women, and they're all asymptomatic, in other words, without symptomatic, they're all totally asymptomatic. Asymptomatic, you mean they don't have any symptoms Nothing. related to totally healthy, healthy. And no symptoms of any vaginal problem. And you do a culture of the vagina, you will find that 20% of the women are culture positive. 20%. If you go back. A month later, and you take the same hundred women, you'll find probably it's still twenty percent. But some women that were positive last month and now become negative, and some women who were negative have become positive because there be changes in the behavioral life experience. And when we talk about life experience, behavior is what we the woman eat, or is the sexual activity of the woman? Uh, yeah. What what influences all those changes? The so diet has very little role. Diet. Little yeah, road. Very little road. Your genes are much more important than yours. So I have to thank my parents. Yes. Oh, no, not me. I don't get a, a vaginal infection. Yeah, that's right. But the, the, my sisters and so on would have to thank their parents yeah. if they had those. Yeah. So, Interesting. So it's a very strongly gen genetic factor. In fact, not only yeast, but all the bacterial profile in the vagina is very genetically determined. Hmm. And therefore, you find that some, or so that if you eventually move from the healthy to the abnormal or the, the, uh, vaginitis situation, it's a very genetically determined uh, factor. It, so now going back again to the vaginitis, mm -hmm. which I think is what you have been doing. Uh, I understand that you have a vaginitis clinic. Is that correct? 
Could you explain to us what is the vaginitis clinic? So I actually developed or created the first vaginitis clinic in the United States. Wow. This started in Philadelphia before I came because I was interested in studying yeast. I was interested in studying candida and there was, there was no more natural place to study them than in the vagina. So I was never a gynecologist. I was an internal medicine infectious disease specialist interested in studying yeast. And, I, and that took me to study them in the yeast. And I wanted to know how yeast got into the vagina, how they survive in the vagina, and what under what circumstances those yeast increase in number and to, to actually cause symptoms or vagina, yeast-induced vaginitis, inflammation of the vagina. Why never in some women, why frequently in other women, etc. And nothing was known about it. It was hmm. not an area, it's because nobody dies from a yeast infection hmm. and, the, and the complications of yeast inflammation in the vagina do not spread outside the vagina. It remains superficial and limited to the vagina. It causes enough symptoms and problems and pain and, and headache in the vagina without it invading. But you never get a systemic, it never spreads into the bloodstream hmm. and it never causes any problems outside of the vagina. It doesn't even cause abdominal pain. So if, if a woman has a yeast infection, she says, I've got abdominal pain. She's got another reason why she has abdominal pain. But it could be related to the no, yeast infection? No, because it's very rare that the yeast ascend outside the vagina. It's very uncommon. If, if a woman, for example, has an IUD, an intrauterine um, device of sorts, occasionally it may cause upper tract problems but it doesn't involve the ovaries and the tubes and everything else. It stays in the vagina. Interesting. You know, let's look at make a stop. I, I know that with some questions from the public uh, about the, the vaginal yeast infection and so on. Uh, I see there is one here from, uh, Dr. go ahead, please. Yes, a uh, question about a vaginal infection and maybe relation to infertility. Does vaginal infection ever cause infertility? So vaginal, inf yeah. Uh, I'm going to come back in a minute to tell you what a vaginitis clinic is because I never got to answer that question. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I will tell you, so yeast infections, uh, uh, vaginal infections are not a common cause of infertility in their own right. Uh, we you know, there, firstly, there are many different kinds and of, of, of vaginal infection. And the problem is that patients, women, do not demand of their doctors whether it's a family practitioner, an internist, or a gynecologist, always they don't demand a diagnosis from the doctors. They tell, oh, you have some vaginitis. That's not acceptable. They have to say, doctor, what kind of vaginitis and why? Mm. And it's, this is a standard that is not adhered to. And they should never be, ex, you know, just uh, ac accept this term vaginitis. So when you talk about vaginitis and infertility, yeast infections are not known to be associated with infertility. If a woman, however, is having recurring yeast infections, one after the other, the inflammation from the vagina will prevent her from having normal intercourse. She's never going to become pregnant. Mm. But it's not from infertility. She's simply not having enough you know, uh, sexual experience in order to become pregnant. But you know, the uh, other forms of vaginitis, and there are many forms of vaginitis, including the most common form of vaginitis is a bacterial infection called bacterial vaginosis. And with bacterial vaginosis, there are dramatic changes in the bacteria in the vagina. With candida or yeast infections, you have got overgrowth of yeast, but there are no dramatic changes in the bacteria in the vagina. So, for example, many women take, uh, when they're having frequent yeast infections, what do they do? They read in magazines, they, they go to the internet, they hear about probiotics. What are probiotics? Probiotics are commercial products that you do not require a prescription to acquire. You buy them over the counter and they're being sold. They're very expensive. They're freely available. There are dozens and dozens of probiotics. And women are told to take the probiotics by mouth or by per vagina in an attempt to prevent yeast infections. And they don't work. 
There's no. no evidence that they work. Most importantly, and yet there are 75% Se of the women that come into my clinic, which specializes in vaginal infections, are taking probiotics. They are expensive. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, industry. Oh, it's, you know, people laugh all the way to the bank. And it's of no value. For whatever. yeast infection. The most well, important reason why don't they work for lots of reasons they don't work. Firstly, the vagina don't even, the, the bacteria in probiotics don't even belong in the vagina. They never survive more than 10 seconds. But most important, there's no lack of lactobacilli, the protective healthy bacteria that, that normally protect the vagina. Yeast infections is not a result of deficiency in any of the protective bacteria that normally populate the vagina. I see. So there's no rational reason to take a probiotic other than to, to make some healthy corporations more, you know, make more profit. <laughs> to add to the industry. So in my clinic, it's a specialist clinic. Yeah. It's not a clinic where people will just arrive off the street. Nothing, you know, almost everybody I see is referred by a, mainly by obstetricians, gynecologists, but occasionally by family practitioners. And uh, occasionally, you know, from uh, Planned Parenthood and the, the STD clinics and so on, I only see everybody's problems. I see the complicated patients. I see everybody, the, the infections that keep recurring month after month or that never go away or, or just cannot be controlled. Could you elaborate a little when you say the, the, is it problematic or with the symptoms what should a woman look to know that she has a, a problematic yeast infection? So, we could, you know, well, you're, you know, so vaginal symptoms, that's what you, you're, you're uh, asking about. So the vaginal symptoms are very different in the different forms of infection. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing specific. So you can't just talk to somebody over the phone and have somebody describe their symptoms and say, oh, you have a yeast infection. Oh, you have a bacterial infection, or you have a parasitic infection, or you have something else, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can't diagnose vaginitis over the phone. One, hmm. two. You can't diagnose vaginitis during a telehealth conference. So no because zoom, no zoom yeah, no diagnosis. Thing. You've got to have the patient come in, and you've got to evaluate the patient. And furthermore, you can't just examine the patient and tell the patient what she has. Mm -hmm. You need to do laboratory tests on the spot, point of care, wherever possible. Sometimes you've got to send out certain tests. Women deserve to have a diagnosis made on every occasion. So it's difficult to diagnose? Uh, well, the, the part of the problem is the symptoms are very nonspecific. You know, it's not as though you can look at the different categories of vaginitis and put them in a, in a table, in a column, and say, this is what you'll see with yeast, which is totally different from what you'll see with a bacterial infection. <laughs> and there are many different kinds of bacterial infections. For example, there's a bacterial infection. The commonest bacterial infection is, is an entity called bacterial vaginosis. And that's very common. And it's particularly, some infections are more common in Caucasian women, and some infections are more common in African-American women, some are more common in, less common in Hispanic women, and et cetera. It's very, very genetically driven. It's, you know, if people fantasize into behavioral factors, it's nonsense. These are genetically determined factors predominantly. You know, the, the, there are a lot, of, a lot of myths about the problem of it that relate to personal hygiene and diet, and this is all nonsense. Uh -huh. Because, I mean, bacterial vaginosis is almost 29% of women in reproductive age in the, US, in the United States. It is, it is the most common infection. It's particularly common in uh, African-American women. And Why African-American? Nobody knows, but it almost certainly relates to the natural bacterial colonization, the actual normal healthy bacteria in African-American women very often differs from Caucasian women. Uh -huh. There are other conditions which are very rare in African-American women. 
so that you, you don't see what we call outside the vagina is the vulva area where you have normal healthy skin, et cetera, et cetera. Those vulva conditions are very rare in African-American women. Hmm. Postmenopausal infections are very rare in African-American women who very often go into menopause at a later age than Caucasian women. So it, it, you just can't generalize. And part of the problem is, as I mentioned before, the symptoms related to each of these entities overlap. And not only, therefore, you can't make the diagnosis over the phone just from talking to somebody. And most importantly, women themselves can't self-diagnose. This is the problem, exactly. So can you guide a woman self, what to look for? A, uh... So self-diagnosis is frequently unacceptable, incorrect, and unreliable. Some women are reliable, but the majority are not. And unfortunately, you also get mixed infections. You mm -hmm. have bacterial and yeast, and you have different kinds, and sometimes you have more resistant bacteria and more resistant yeast. So there is a it, nice balance of those two. It requires a specialist to, to sort things out. So what started off as one clinic 35 years ago, today there are about at least a dozen in the United States and maybe another dozen all over the world. And that's still not enough. No, but every, a problem in, in, no in, in, in every major urban area, there should be a, more than that. There should be a, a vaginitis. Sorry to interrupt you. I, I think we are going to open for the questions of the public because they're coming a lot. So we want to give an opportunity to everybody. So there is a first question here. So called the administration of oral antibiotics cause bacterial vaginosis by triggering dysbiosis in the vagina. Yeah. Uh, and it can trigger dysbiosis in the gastrointestinal system. Also, women who experience hormonal acne are sometimes prescribed antibiotics. Where we're learning seems to suggest that this is ill advice. What do you say about that? Okay, so antibiotics, uh, I just want to say this, when it comes to yeast candida infection, you have to separate the fundamental disorder. What leads to a yeast infection in a woman is the genetic susceptibility. But once, but the actual attacks of yeast infections needs more than just the genes. It needs a trigger. The commonest trigger is antibiotic use. Oh wow! So, it's but it, but it's not it's not it's a if, you, if you have the right genes, you can take all the antibiotics in the world. <laughs> you're never going to get a yeast infection. And do we know it, what are the genes who provide protection? There's or no? been inadequate. Yes, we have we we have some knowledge of the genetic susceptibility, okay. but there's no gene test you can do. Oh, there is not whether or not there should be a gene test, but no one has we haven't made enough progress to diagnose a specific genetic susceptibility. So you need a trigger. So the, the commonest trigger for the vaginal yeast infection is antibiotics. And it doesn't matter whether antibodies are taken by mouth, on the skin, or in or, anywhere or, or that you take it. or and not and not all antibiotics have the same uh, ability to cause a yeast infection. In particular, tetracyclines or or the uh, or clindamycin, both of which are used for acne, among the commonest cause of a vaginal yeast infection oh, so is, are the dermatology prescribed wow. antibiotics used for acne. So the question of heat over the dense, that is so the answer is yes. yes, antibiotics can trigger and they are the, by far the commonest cause of, as a recognized trigger of vaginal yeast infection. We have not found that association at all with bacterial vaginosis. Bacterial vaginosis is a predominantly sexually transmitted infection, yeast vaginitis, candida vaginitis is not sexually transmitted. Okay, so let's see if we can summarize to, uh, to everybody, it's super understanding. So we have to separate what is the bacterial vaginosis as one disease, let's put it in this, and yeast infection as a, a separate. But what is the connection between the both of you? If you have yeast infection, that can also predispose to bacterial vaginosis? No. So, Yeast infections do not predispose to bacterial infection, but bacterial vaginosis predisposes to yeast infection. Okay. 
The commonest cause of recurring vaginal yeast infections in Southeast Michigan is bacterial vaginosis. Hmm. Why does bacterial vaginosis predispose to yeast infections? For two reasons. One is that you treat bacterial infections with antibiotics per se. And secondly, the, the abnormal bacteria present in bacterial vaginosis create changes in the normal defense mechanism in the vaginal wall, the ability to respond to, to inflammation that predisposes it to it. So if you want to solve the problem of recurring yeast infections in Southeast Michigan, solve the problem of bacterial vaginosis. And how do you solve the problem of bacterial vaginosis? <laughs> Well, bacterial vaginosis, having, having said that, has been the most common infection uh, in, in, in women throughout the world. Throughout the world, it is. In the reproductive age, yeah? Yeah, you do not get bacterial vaginosis in after the menopause. Not after the menopause. No. And also be in, in, uh, in young girls. Definitely, you definitely get neither yeast infections or bacterial vaginosis in pre menopause in pre menopausal or pre menopausal yeah. before puberty and on. but but what is less well known is that of the, the abnormal bacteria in the vagina that cause bacterial vaginosis needs estrogen okay and so therefore in the postmenopausal woman in the absence of estrogen you can't get bv so or bacterial you, vaginosis Unless the woman is getting hormone replacement therapy. Once she's a 60 or 70 or 80 year old woman, is taking hormone replacement therapy, that puts her in the same risk as if she was 20 or 30 or 40. Huh. Uh, the prevention, before we go to, uh, to pregnant infertility and pregnancy, what is the prevention? So, so the prevention of vaginitis depends on the cause of the vaginitis. So, for example, there's a parasite that causes vaginitis, which is purely sexually transmitted, called trichomonas. And you see a lot of trichomonas vaginal infections in, in, in Detroit or in Southeast Michigan. You want to prevent trichomonas, you, a woman must use a, um, a, must have some form of barrier protection. In other words, condoms. Condom use Will, will result, will prevent trichomonas infections. Uh -huh. Nothing else will. There's nothing you can take in your diet or in your hygiene or anything that's going to prevent a trichomonal infection other than uh, the use of a condom. Even yeast, has now, as far as yeast infections are concerned, it doesn't help to use a condom because it's not sexually transmitted, the yeast yeah. infection. Diet has minimal role in the overwhelming majority of women. Um, it's really minimal. Occasionally, you'll find some, you know, we know that if you're a diabetic and you're prone to yeast infection, and you are a diabetic, mm. then controlling your diabetes will make it easier to control the yeast infection. Some women who are, who are not diabetic will nevertheless tell you that they tend to get the trigger for their yeast infections. The trigger is not antibiotics. The trigger is when they have a diet or a meal with a lot of refined sugars and that may trigger a yeast infection. But 90% of women will tell you it makes no difference to them. Really? In that individual, it is a trigger. So mm -hmm. identifying triggers is useful, but not an easy so Some women, the, the, the whole idea of the high sugars, so for it's, my, it's a specific percent. So very only woman. for a specific woman. So let me go to this. this so this, so I want you to want just yeah. finish answering my yeah. question about prevention of infection. Yeah, because that's the question. What are you advise to women to prevent recording BB? I will come. Okay. You will come to that. So let's just finish prevention of the yeast infections. Yes. If you're having yeast infection, your diet isn't going to help you much. Okay. You avoid antibiotics, or if you're going to take an antibiotic, ask the doctor to give you an, a, a medic, some oral medication with it, such as Staclucan, Fluconazole, which will prevent you getting that inevitable yeast infection after the antibiotics mm. that you're getting for a, for a sore throat or sinusitis and so on. So a woman who has an infection in somewhere else and taking antibiotics, she should be thinking, I also need to protect my yeast infection. If she's prone to yeast infection, she should ask a practitioner to give her a prophylactic measures. Probiotics don't work because yeast infections 
occur in women who have normal healthy bacteria in the vagina. And that there are no good studies that show that taking probiotics by mouth or vaginally prevent yeast infections. So the only way you can really prevent them is by finding me by prescribing medication by mouth, preferably because of the convenience on a long-term basis to prevent these infections. So now for the for the last 20 years, we've been using diflucan once a week. Take a diflucan once a week in a woman who's having multiple yeast infections. This will achieve a 90% control of her vaginal yeast infections. Wow. 90% of the time, she will be totally free of yeast infections, giving her a totally normal sexual and other life and, and experience. Fascinating. And, um, but it doesn't cure them. Taking the diflucan once a week, highly protective but not curative. Why not? Well, she's the reason why it's not curing her because you're not curing the genetic susceptibility. Well, that is something fascinating that I never thought about. Yeah. So genes have some, some role. Oh, absolutely. So let's go see the... So we know very little about the genetic susceptibility to bacteria. I'm impressed. I mean, today with and the and DNA... Uh, and unfortunately, there's very little that can be done to prevent bacterial vaginosis prevention. It doesn't help to take probiotics. So, so, sorry to interrupt you, because we're getting a lot of questions and there's a lot of interest in what you're saying. It says, do you recommend treating partners for women with recurrent BB? Absolutely not. Even no. though we know there is sexual transmission of the bad bacteria in the vagina that are present in bacterial vaginosis, if you were to take a culture of the male urethra, go into the, the penis and go put a little, a little swab, which is not so comfortable. That is very painful. You know, into, <laughs> into the male urethra and you would do a culture or you would do a smear or you would take, you know, do a microscopic evaluation. You will find the same bacteria in the male urethra that you find in the- So now you are really confused. Yeah. So, but you're seeing it as a sexual transmitted disease. So what is the transmission? The, what the, the initial infection in bacterial vaginosis is always a sexual transmission. But who is, trans, is the male is transmitted the to the male woman. transmitted to the female. However, once these bacteria are present in the vagina, you are, most women who get a treatment for the first episode of bacterial vaginosis will never have a recurrence. They'll do well. Some women will recur. So when you're dealing with recurrence, Recurring infections, these are women with bacterial vaginosis who are having an attack every month or two. Literally every month. Every or month. Two, they get antibiotics, the so called good antibiotics, you know, great antibiotics that we prescribe. It helps for a month or two and back it comes. It can come back for one of two reasons. I was going to ask you are they developing resistance to antibiotics or is it a different type of bacteria? Good question. Excellent. Some of the women are recurring. Because they're being reinfected. Oh, by the. By so, the what same, is the husband giving? So, by the same partner. Is he giving and abnormal will, bacteria or different bacteria or pathogenic bacteria? No, they're giving, they're giving pathogenic bacteria. Pathogenic. But why the male doesn't have any symptoms? The male has, you know, um, I, I, we don't know why God So, one of the questions is should we treat the male? <laughs> there is no effective treatment for males. We've done multiple studies. We just completed a very expensive study. We did we did for five years. We were treating male partners, and, and no effect. On it. No benefit whatsoever. My goodness! And fortunately, the the men are told that it may be sexually transmitted. They go to the doctor. The doctor says, "No, it's not sexually sexually transmitted." I'm telling you, it is sexually transmitted. <laughs> but it, the, besides, the males never develop symptoms. Wow! But Depending on the population you're seeing, a substantial number of the women who recur with a thorough infection, it's not due to sexual transmission, it's due to relapse. In other words, the antibiotics we give, the flagell, the clindamycin, the antibiotics, the, the metrogels, etc., they simply provide a temporary relief. They, could, they decrease the number of bad bacteria in the vagina for a few weeks and back they come, and never are the healthy bacteria restored. 
So in other words, these women are, re are recurring. Now the recurrences can be due to multiple mechanisms and that's where all the research is going on at the moment. Mm. Sometimes there is antibiotic resistance. So you can actually find that these women unfortunately become colonized with highly resistant antibodies. And we've discovered one of the studies in my clinic, we discovered that one of the reasons why they keep recurring is that they get an antibiotic they feel better, but they never eradicate the bad bacteria which are remain in the vagina as part of what is called the biofilm. And the mm. biofilm is a film, a liquid film on the, in the lines of the vagina. And you, there's normally a healthy biofilm. This is an abnormal biofilm. And the bad bacteria are able to hide in this Biofilm. So the antibiotic will not reach the bad. The, yeah, the, the, the antibiotic does not penetrate, and, the, and besides which, the bacteria in the biofilm under, undergo mutations. They become more resistant. Wow. They, they change the, their format. It's a real it. fight. Eh? So the so so it's a very, clever so, word. So the management of recurrent bacterial vaginosis yeah. is a major challenge, and we've made a lot of progress but we've made only half a step forward. Mm. And I think, but probiotics don't work. One of the, one of the, you know, it's some women have become so frustrated by the recurrent disease. So we have, we have developed different, you know, my clinic specializes in bacterial vaginosis. And we see women from all over the state with recurrent bacterial vaginosis. Our cure rates are high, but never, but not guaranteed because this is very hard to treat. The, the subject is fascinating. I think we'll be here for two hours, but we don't have those two hours, unfortunately. Um, and there is a lot of questions now. I think we will move to the part of pregnancy. There is a lot of concern from the questions of the public. Is this, is vaginitis always going to have an effect on the pregnancy? So are we talking about a pregnant woman with vaginitis or, or the other so way around? Let's go to what there are two aspects. One is, what is the effect of vaginitis while pregnant? So in a woman who is prone to veg recurring vaginal yeast infections, when they become pregnant because of the estrogen positive atmosphere that is created, they often, it will, it will become much more severe, much more recurrent and more difficult to handle. Mm. And especially since many of the drugs we use, such as diflucan or fluconazole, we don't use in pregnancy. Many of the drugs cannot be used in pregnancy. So your armamentarium, your list of drugs available to use in pregnancy dramatically shrinks because you don't want to use a drug in pregnancy that's going to hurt the fetus, of course. create an early abortion or cause prematurity, etc. Well, so management in, in pregnancy is more difficult and we don't use diflucan, which, which was a major advance in the treatment of recurrent disease. So that's, so on the other but hand- the lack of treatment and the presence of the vaginitis during pregnancy no. will have an impact on the success of the pregnancy well, or the development of the fetus. The recurrent uh, yeast infections are not associated with preterm labor or prematurity. And pro pro problem. They simply make life, if you're having re repeated yeast infections throughout your pregnancy, makes life very miserable. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't put a risk in no, the pregnancy itself. No. no. Yeah. Um, whether or not bacterial vaginosis contributes to infertility is an yeah. entirely a different story and it's not well studied. Not well studied and it's been rather ignored. And that's a major area for research and something that we're just getting involved in. But bacterial vaginosis as a, in pregnancy is entirely different. Bacterial vaginosis in pregnancy is associated with preterm labor, prematurity, um, and as well as early in, in pregnancy, it can be associated with increased fetal loss and, uh, and, and so forth. So the management of bacterial vaginosis in pregnancy is 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 a, a much similarly a challenge and a problem. But it's very important, and it's a subject of another hour's discussion, <laughs> because many women who have bacterial vaginosis, half the women that have this bacterial vaginosis are asymptomatic. Mm. They don't even know they have this infection. Mm. 
Okay. So the, 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 the obstetrician gynecology community are challenged by, by the question as to whether they should screen all women at their first visit during, you know, during pregnancy when they first, you know, when the first issue is they have a pap smear and a whole host of other tests done, whether or not they should be screened for bacterial vaginosis. And so far, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the CDC and all the various statutory uh, groups do not re recommend screening routinely for recommend. BV in pregnancy. And the reason being is it's very hard to cure bacterial vaginosis. Mm. So you don't want to start trouble in someone who's asymptomatic. Yeah, but in the, we're not affecting... On the, on the other hand, if a woman is seen, who we call, consider is high risk of preterm labor, oh, maturity, yeah. then it's a different story that the woman that is at higher risk we do screen and we do make efforts to control in pregnancy. Fantastic, interesting. There is a question here about birth control. Is birth control increased risk of yeast, yeast infection? It is a very minor increased risk. In general, you know, I, I see many women with recurrent yeast infections and their first step is, can I stop my birth control tablet or they've already stopped. It is very rare that you stop recurring yeast infections by stopping birth control. Mm. So there is another question, but I think you mentioned already, if I, acquire, if I acquire yeast infection, will this affect my pregnancy in the future? Sorry. The, if I acquire yeast infection, no. will this affect my pregnancy in the future? No. As long as you control the yeast infections and you're having normal intercourse, you're at the same risk as everybody else of becoming pregnant. But there's a question there about, uh, you know, besides birth control, there's another question there. We have found Saccharomyces oh, yes. cerevisiae in few patients who are typing these kinds of vaginas. Is this something we need to consider in the case? If the answer is yes, yeah. So the answer is Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a very common yeast. It's not candida, it's a common yeast. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is, has other names. It's also called Baker's yeast. It's the yeast that is used when you're breaking bread or cake or whatever else. It is also used in fermentation for beers, beers and, yeah. and, 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 and liquor. So Saccharomyces is widely spread. It is very common in the gastrointestinal tract. Because it's made it, in the bread. But it, yeah, in the bread. But it is an uncommon pathogen. So less than 1% of women who have vaginal yeast infections Actually, it's caused by Saccharomyces. 98 to 99 percent is going to be Candida species, the various different Candida species. They're not all the same, mm. and each requires a specialized form of treatment. So, if you find a symptomatic woman who's got Saccharomyces in her in the vaginal swabs, the cultures, and this will be identified by the lab. You can't look at a patient and say you have Saccharomyces. The lab says this patient's culture is positive, not for candida, but for Saccharomyces. We do treat it. Most of the time, Saccharomyces will respond to diflucan or fluconazole and the conventional yeast. Not always. It's a systemic treatment or is it local treatment? It's oral or topical. Oral or topical. Yeah. Oral or topical. The creams. Yeah. But a small number, it will be resistant to the, to the diflucans and the fluconazoles and so on, in which case we, we treat them with boric acid. Oh, and I think we had a question about boric acid. Yeah, this was from our RSVP question. So they asked if boric acid tablets inserted vaginally are safe. The question is boric acid is safe. Okay, so let me tell you about boric acid if you don't mind. Okay. Please. Do you have time? We have time. time. Do you have time? No, no, okay. <laughs> so boric acid has been around for 200 years. It was discovered. It's almost Joseph. my age, by the way. By, by Joseph Lister, a very famous British microbiologist, physician, yeah. and it's been available. And it was first used as an antimicrobial, actually, when in, this, in, the, um, in the Crimean War where they used to put the bandages they, into boric acid and then into the wounds, it was called boracic lint. Mm. Boracic, boric acid, if taken by mouth, is highly toxic. Mm. 
And therefore, boric acid is banned in many countries because they fear that children would gain access to boric acid and it can be highly toxic if it's toxic and it can be lethal if taken by mouth. So it's never taken parenterally, in, in, intravenously, by intramuscular, through the skin or by mouth. But it is often used for superficial infections. You know, we'll describe the kind. So it's often used in some eye drops, in ear solution, in some wound treatment, and it was in the vagina. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was used again uh, in the days before Diflucan and these and and uh, these newer drugs were available. When when the, the standard of care was even before clotrimazole or gynilotrimin and all these drugs became available, they used to use gentian violet for decades. Yeah. It's an anti-infective, but mm -hmm. it's a very weak anti-infective, but quite good against yeast. So they used mm -hmm. to treat vaginal yeast infections with gentian violet. Another thing they used was boric acid, yeah. but it was a douche or they would give capsules. When the new drugs came along, the diflucans, the clotrimazoles, the myconazoles, they were much more efficient and effective and if you use gentian violet, you couldn't use it once. You had to use it for seven to 14 days. Oh. The same thing with boric acid. You had to use it for 14 days. So is it a good anti-yeast? It's not bad, but not single dose. It has to be given two weeks. And therefore it went out of popularity. It, people stopped using boric acid because they had all these wonderful new drugs that you could give for a day. You could use monostat for three days, monostat for one day, monostat, et cetera. And the yeast will be gone. And they treated the thing. Just efficient. But one thing about boric acid, boric acid is effective against the resistance. Mm, okay. And then it's got to be given for at least at least two weeks. Is it safe? It's remarkably safe as long as you don't take it by mouth. I tell the patients every time I prescribe it, don't take it by mouth because I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> so so, vaginally, it is a, for many years, it was not available. So if you wanted to prescribe it, and the only time we prescribe boric acid, never in pregnancy. Yeah, never in pregnancy. No safety data in pregnancy. So no, well, I may not, in 30 years time or 20 years time, I may, they may use it in pregnancy, but today, no yeah. safety data in pregnancy. It's always given per vagina, and it was, you had to give a prescription, for, and the patient went to a compounding pharmacy, and they took a little gelatin capsule, mm -hmm. and they filled it with this industrial powder or crystalline powder of boric acid. And I was the first person to be using it in this area. Mm. And when we used it, I didn't know how much to give. So I went to the pharmacy and I said, how could we give it? They said, well, we could put it in gelatin capsules. So I said, how much does it hold? They said, we don't know. We'll try that. Poured it in. They said, oh, it holds 600 milligrams. I said, okay, that's the dose. <laughs> <laughs> so I started using it 20 years ago. But only for women who had resistance. resistance thing. And it was not available. Yeah. And so along came Amazon. Now you can get, without the prescription, you can go online to Amazon.com and, you can and, learn you'll see, and, and if you look up boric acid, it will show you 15 or 20 different kinds of boric acid. And it's not that expensive and it is an alternative for 14 day treatment mm. only for resistant things. The problem oh, is now that it's no longer over the counter, uh, over, no longer requiring a prescription. Women are ordering it all the time. Doctors are using it without knowing what to use it. You don't just prescribe boric acid when a woman has persistent symptoms and you're not sure what's going on. In case they have a resistance strain, the woman patient needs a diagnosis. If she has a resistance strain, then consider using boric okay. acid. Okay, so I the message, a... just to summarize that, the message is having the diagnosis, Determine if it is resistant and then go to boric yeah. and don't drink it. Yeah. Don't take it by mouth. Now, boric acid, unfortunately, I started using it by chance 
by chance. I had a patient about 15 years ago who had a mixed infection with a resistant yeast and boric and bacterial vaginosis. Oh. So she had at the same time bacterial vaginosis and a resistant yeast. It's bad enough to have recurrent yeast infection. That's one plague. Having a resistant yeast that is recurrent, second plague. Having recurrent bacterial vaginosis, strike three, you're out. That's really tough. She had both. So I prescribed her antibiotic for her bacterial vaginosis. And I gave her boric acid only because she had resistance. The resistance. And it's the bar and the bacterial vaginosis dramatically got better much more quickly. So I said to myself, I wonder if there's any synergy between the boric acid I'm giving for the yeast in, with the antibiotic. And so I did several studies which are now being published and are now widely used. Boric acid is synergistic with, with an it. antibiotic. It's no good for bacterial vaginosis alone. alone. Oh. But so now I use a combination of both and they have to be given together. And so that why prevents so recurrence so or not? So why does bacteria, why does boric acid work? It works because one, it's got antibacterial activity, which is not bad, not great. That's why you need to use it with an antibiotic. Yeah. But boric acid is unique and it does what antibiotics don't, doesn't, don't do. And that is it removes the biofilm. Oh, the biofilm. So it removes yeah. those inaccessible Bacteria that have found hosti, you know, that have found uh, that have been able to find those. We have escaped it's from this. Escape. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, if in the public you have, you would like also to ask questions by um, removing the the mute, please feel free to do it. Uh, we're getting close to the the, the seven o'clock, so let's talk a little about. Um, you mentioned about menopausal women. Yeah. Uh, all these problems of vaginitis, you mentioned they are disappearing, but we know a lot of uh, postmenopausal women had uh, complications in the vagina, dryness, the hormonal changes. What are the major concerns in postmenopausal women about yeast and, and uh, vaginitis? So, like premenopausal women, when a, when a postmenopausal woman develops vaginal symptoms, and they may be in the vagina or they may be in the vulva, the, we, okay, we call them collectively vulva vaginal symptoms, she needs a diagnosis. And she, the diagnosis is going to be made by the gynecologist. And um, the treatment will be depending on what the diagnosis is. Now, the commonest cause of vulva vaginal symptoms in a postmenopausal woman uh, will also depend on whether or not she's excuse me, she's taking hormone replacement therapy or estrogen therapy. And by far the commonest cause will be, will be uh, a syndrome of estrogen deficiency, which, mm. you know, which we call the, um, the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, yeah. or, which used to be called vaginal atrophy. As the estrogen going down, so, the secretions in the vagina also decrease. So dryness, so is, dryness, of dryness is common. And this is associated initially just with dryness and with time as it gets worse and worse over the years. And this is a slow process over many years. The, the dryness may result with painful in painful intercourse and they get, and now, and now it becomes a, ma a major issue, which is not solved by using lubricants. It's not solved with the lubricants. Lubricants do not solve the problem of estrogen deficiency. So but it solves the, some of the problems with the bacterial infections, yeast infections in, in postmenopausal women. What does? The, the lubricants. No, no, lubricants are simply used to facilitate intercourse. Yes. And have no influence on infection. But so with the, uh, so what you need to do is make your diagnosis. So yeah. when a woman has complaints, the gynecologist will therefore be required to say, is all his symptoms, is this discharge, is this irritation, is this pain, is this discomfort, is this itching the result of estrogen deficiency? Can I prove she has estrogen deficiency? Yeah. And they do this by clinically evaluating the patient and doing appropriate labs. And then they replace the estrogen 
And in the past, we only were able to do it by mouth or transdermally. And now there are many, many local intravaginal treatments that without causing any systemic or generalized um, complications can adequately replace the estrogen that is missing. Mm. And, um, but bacterial vaginosis doesn't occur in postmenopausal women unless they're on hormone replacement therapy. And even Only then, with their and even then it's rare. But there are other syndromes. There are, for, there are just a whole host of other causes of, of vaginitis. So the list of vaginal infections is enormous. Um, and, you know, um, from streptococci to etc. You know, there's just a whole host of causes. And we haven't talked also about sexual first media diseases no, and so on. But I think, I don't know if there is any other question from the public. I know we are getting already seven o'clock. So we better start uh, wrapping up. Um, so we, we, we're stopping up for an hour, but we're going for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> We're very strict, and I know you're no, busy, no, and everybody has questions. No, 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 no problem. So maybe we can talk a little. We know that we are made of bacteria. We have so much bacteria in our body, like the gastrointestinal yeah. tract, and the, the female reproductive tract, and I think also the male reproductive tract, has been for many years thought to be a sterile. So no bacteria in the female reproductive tract. And I think this is an area that is changing. Can you comment a little yeah. about that? So, so the, it is normal for every infant, female, child, adolescent, adult, as well as postmenopausal woman, to have bacteria in the vagina. The vagina is never sterile. It is just full of bacteria. In the same numbers as are present in the gastrointestinal entirely different from the, the gastrointestinal. That's the fascinating, the steep and, and, um, and for the most part, healthy women are going to have bacteria and they will, and the, the bacterial community will be dominated by protective, healthy bacteria. Not so easy to change the bacteria in the vagina. I wish probiotics worked. We don't know why taking suppositories, solutions, ovules of bac made up of bacteria and high numbers and putting them into the vagina. Most of the time, even when you put the, you grow the right protective bacteria in the test tube, you put them into a suppository, you put them in the vagina, they don't persist. No, These, in other words, the woman's natural own bacteria resist what we call exogenous or toxins, in other words, other external No, for it, no foreigners. <laughs> no foreigners. No foreigners. Anti immigration. <laughs> with that, I really want to thank you. It was a fascinating hour. I'm sure everybody shared with us. Uh, I want to leave the message that indeed, we are just understanding what is the role of bacteria. I mean, you would talk about a lot of pathological conditions, but I think the new area is what is doing helping us to be here in this world? And we know that bacteria may play, remember this, and maybe we can do another session about that. Maybe bacteria is an important factor why we are here. Bacteria contributes to our reproduction. And that is an area maybe we can organize. What is the role of bacteria? Without bacteria, maybe we will not be here today. Okay. Again, thank you so much, Dr. So. It was a pleasure having you with us here. I hope we will have another one. I just want to remind everybody that uh, next month we will have um, another uh, subject that I'm sure would be interesting for all of you, and that is infertility and assisted reproduction. And uh, we're going to have as an invited expert, Dr. Ruhi Jelani. She is a uh, reproductive endocrinology and an expert in assisted reproduction. So I hope we can uh, have you again next month talking about infertility and assisted reproduction. Again, thank you for coming and thank you everybody for uh, joining us this evening and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much.